There are many major mysteries in the A Song of Ice and Fire series. Mysteries are one of the features that have kept fans entranced and entertained after all these years. Mysteries such as the parentage of a certain so-called bastard, the motives of a certain eunuch, and the origins of an ancient enemy. These major mysteries have led to countless hours of theorizing and debate. But alongside the major mysteries, there are minor mysteries to be found within the text as well. Smaller events that inspire questions and give rise to more simpler concerns, oddities, and curiosities. And although they are small, they invite intense investigation as well. The ideas found here may not be broad in scope, but hopefully these ideas pique your interest, maybe even spark your imagination, or mayhaps they may even chill your blood. I present to you a collection of short theories, Volume 1, House of Blackfire foreshadowed in Book 1. The renegade House of Blackfire was first mentioned in A Storm of Swords, Book 3 of A Song of Ice and Fire. But what if I told you foreshadowing of their arrival might be found dating back all the way to Book 1? Here's how. When we first meet Lord Varys, who many believe is a secret Blackfire, he is described as being plump, perfumed, powdered, and as hairless as an egg. Egg was the affectionate nickname given to Aegon, son of Makar. He would come to be known as King Aegon V of that noble name. But in his youth, he traveled the Seven Kingdoms as the squire of a knight named Sir Duncan the Tall. Their exploits can be read in the series of novellas called The Tales of Dunk and Egg. Incidentally, the plot of the third Dunk and Egg book, The Mystery Knight, features one of the many Blackfire rebellions. To be sure, the Dunk and Egg novellas had yet to be published when Lord Varys first sauntered onto the page. However, George R. R. Martin is a self-professed gardener writer, which means he is always planting seeds for future development. Egg shaves his head bald to hide his Valyrian silver gold hair. Perhaps Varys is as hairless as an egg for a similar reason. In the same chapter we first meet Varys, we are told Magor the Cruel had the Red Keep built to include a series of hidden passageways. He then had all the builders executed, for he declared only the blood of the dragon would know the secrets of the Red Keep. We later discover Varys has indeed learned many of the castle's secrets. Could this be a clever hint to the true nature of his bloodline? When Arya gets lost in those secret tunnels, she finds herself in a room full of black dragon skulls. Hiding in the dark, she inadvertently overhears a conversation between Lord Varys and Illyrio Mopatis. Arya ends up doing what Lord Varys trained his little mice and little birds to do, steal secrets. It is here among the black dragon skulls that Varys and Illyrio discuss their endgame the crowning of a secret prince who claims the name Targaryen, the House of the Red Dragon, but their scheming and plotting is done in the dark, surrounded by black dragon skulls. Lastly, in the city of Vase Dothrak, Daenerys rides past the statues of gods and heroes that the Dothraki have stolen from those they have conquered and brought back to their sacred city. Among the various idols, she observes, quote, Monsters stood in the grass beside the road, black iron dragons with jewels for eyes, roaring griffins, manticores with their barbed tails poised to strike, and other beasts she could not name. End quote. You will notice many of these monsters are sigils of Westerosi houses, and all these houses have something in common, a relation to House Targaryen. The griffin is the sigil of House Connington, a former ally of the Targaryens that may turn into an enemy. The final two are well known for their infamy. The Manticore is the sigil of House Lorch. The Black Dragon is of course the sigil of House Blackfire. Olena Tyrell and the Wedding Cloaks Evidence for who was involved in the Purple Wedding is not just found in Sansa's hairnet, but also in the Lannister and Baratheon Wedding Cloaks as well. Here's how. 
When Joffrey and Marjorie were wed, Cersei Lannister insisted Joffrey drape his bride-to-be in the red and gold Lannister cloak that she once wore. This, as you could imagine, was quite unusual. Typically, the groom uses his father's wedding cloak bearing the sigil of their house. This symbolizes the bride moving from her father's protection into her lord husband's. It also represents a changing of identity. Marjorie was not becoming Marjorie Lannister after all. She was becoming Marjorie Baratheon. Cersei has always wanted House Lannister to be just as prominent as House Baratheon in display whenever possible. Something Jon Snow noticed in A Game of Thrones when he sees Joffrey wearing a padded surcoat with a lion and stag embroidered on the front. Quote, the Lannisters are proud, Jon observed. you think the royal sigil would be sufficient, but no. He makes his mother's house equal in honor to the kings." End quote. It is also true that Cersei simply hated the Baratheons and did not want to see the crown stag at any wedding if she could help it. But the Queen of Thorns had her own ideas on the matter, and this is how we can be sure Olenna was the poisoner at the Purple Wedding. In the case of the marriage between Joffrey and Marjorie, Lady Olenna did not object to the usage of the Lannister wedding cloak. Why? Because she knew the wedding was a sham. It would never be consummated. Joffrey would not survive the night. He would die clawing at his throat, desperate for air, poisoned by a black amethyst from a shy. When Olenna and Marjorie arrived at court, they questioned Sansa fiercely to determine if the rumors they heard at Bitterbridge were true. Was Joffrey as terrible as they were led to believe? Under intense pressure, Sansa confirmed it all. Quote, Joffrey is a monster. He's evil and cruel, my lady. It is so, and the queen as well. Lady Olenna Tyrell and her granddaughter exchanged a look. Ah, said the old woman, that's a pity. End quote. At that moment, Joffrey's fate was sealed. Rather than hand her precious Marjorie over to a rabid lion, Olenna decided she would put him down. There was no avoiding the Lannister Tyrell alliance. However, her son Mace insisted on it. So if the Rose must wed the lion, she would choose which lion cub it would be. Olenna did not care about Joffrey's wedding. Tommen's wedding, however, must appear as legitimate as possible, which was why when Cersei attempted to have Tommen use the Lannister cloak, Olenna caused a fuss. Quote, Cersei had wanted to use the fine red silk cloak Joffrey had used. It was the cloak my lord father used when he wed my lady mother, she explained to the Tyrells, but the Queen of Thorns had balked her in that as well. That old thing? The crone had said, it looks a bit threadbare to me, and dare I say unlucky, and wouldn't a stag be more fitting for King Robert's trueborn son? In my day, a bride donned her husband's colors, not his lady mother's, thanks to Stannis and his filthy letter, there were already too many rumors concerning Tommen's parentage. Cersei dared not fan the fires by insisting that he drape his bride in Lannister crimson, so she yielded as gracefully as she could." End quote. Lady Olenna managed to get her way. Her granddaughter married plump and tender Tommen. Joffrey is in his grave, but danger still remains. Queen Cersei Lannister, a lion of the rock, has been backed into a corner, and you never want to corner a restless animal. Quote, I will see you dead, old woman. Cersei promised herself as the Queen of Thorns tottered off between her towering guardsmen, a pair of seven-footers that it amused her to call left and right. We'll see how sweet a corpse you make. Stannis Baratheon, the last Storm King. Many have remarked upon the similarities between A Song of Ice and Fire and the fantasy trilogy Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. It would take a much longer video for me to detail all the comparisons, so for now I want to discuss one character from Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn who has many things in common with Stannis Baratheon, and how that character's fate may serve as further proof that Lord Stannis has a dark future ahead of him. Here's how. 
One of the antagonists in Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn is a king named Elias. As a new king with a failing reputation, Elias sits uneasy upon the dragon bone chair. The immense throne made of yellowed dragon bones that once belonged to a dragon his father is said to have slain. Elias believes that his brother Joshua seeks to dethrone him even though Joshua has no ambitions to be king. Elias's paranoia is fed by his new advisor, the Red Priest Pyrotes, a foreign-born sorcerer who craves unlimited power. Pyrotes uses his magic to aid Elias in his civil war against his brother. Elias's only child, the Princess Miriamel, flees from her father before she can become swept up in the strange sorceries surrounding him. As you can see, Elias and Stannis have many similarities. They both have a red wizard for an advisor, a uniquely made throne, a daughter in danger, as well as a rivalry with their younger brother. And there's more. We learn in the final book of the series, so spoilers abound, that Pyrotes has been betraying Elias throughout the entire series. He has been using potions and spells to weaken Elias' body. This is so Elias can become a vessel for the vengeful spirit of the Storm King. In Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, the Storm King was also known as Enoluki. He was once a prince among an elven-like race of beings known as the Sithi. The Sithi ruled a land called Austin Ard until humans crossed the sea to invade. These were the first men the Sithi had ever encountered. War between the two races broke out. The Sithi were robbed of their land. Their castles were conquered and claimed. Their sacred trees destroyed. Quote, the trees are burning. Where is the prince? The witchwood is in flames. The gardens are burning. End quote. Where Pyrotes is a clear-cut villain, in his introduction, he steps on a puppy and kills it, Melisandre is not so easily defined. Her actions may seem horrendous, her methods questionable, but she truly believes in Stannis and his cause. However, she did kill his brother, she has been using Stannis' life force to create shadow assassins, and though she doesn't lust for power in the same way Pyrotes does, she does understand the trappings of power, how it's measured, and what are the best ways power can be accentuated. Her whole identity may be false, but she's established this red persona so that men do not underestimate her power. Inaluki was considered the Storm King of Austin Ard. When people have terrible visions of his shapeless shadow form, they believe he has horns protruding from his skull. In truth, he wore a crown of antlers when he lived as Prince of the Sithi. The horns people see are actually just a crown. Before Aegon's conquest of Westeros, Stannis' ancestors under House Durandon were known as the Storm Kings. They wore crowns of a similar design. The similarities are there, they are not one-to-one -one perfect, which makes sense because it's one thing to be inspired, it's another thing to completely rip off another writer. There's even enough there that I am certain Elias's transformation into a malevolent entity is the fate that lies ahead for Lord Stannis. And what does the Storm King of Austin Ard want? The same thing the others want in Westeros, the complete removal of humanity. Quote, Perhaps some city boy once sat here in this same quiet place, listening to the night. Where did that breeze come from? A voice seemed to whisper, whisper the words too faint to hear. Perhaps he ran his hands across this same stone. A whisper on the wind. We will have it back, man child. We will have it all back. Clutching the neck of his coat tight against the unexpected chill, Simon got up and climbed the grassy slope, suddenly lonesome, for familiar voices and light. Jon Snow's ending foreshadowed. Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn is not the only series of books that George R. R. Martin acknowledges served as inspiration for A Song of Ice and Fire. 
A series of seven historical fiction novels provided Martin with several ideas that he would incorporate into his main series. And if you just so happen to read them, Jon Snow's ending on the show may not have been so surprising. Here's why. The Accursed Kings is the name of a series of seven novels written by the French novelist Maurice Drouin. Published between the years 1955 through 1977, the novels follow the reigns of the last five Capetian kings and the first two kings of the House of Valois. Their novels are filled to the brim with political intrigue, royal scandals, and surprising deaths. Fans of A Song of Ice and Fire would quite enjoy them. George R. R. Martin has expressed his great appreciation for the series. He has even written the foreword for each of the seven novels. The covers of each novel now bear his quote. This is the original Game of Thrones, with titles like The Strangled Queen, The Lily and the Lion, and The She-Wolf, the influence the series has had on Martin is strikingly evident. The title of the seventh and last book, The King Without a Kingdom, may be the most revealing of all. The end of season 8 of Game of Thrones saw Jon Snow imprisoned and then sentenced to the wall for the murder of Queen Daenerys Targaryen. Because Jon is a Targaryen himself, this meant he was guilty of murder, queenslaying, and kinslaying. Terrible crimes and sins that could not be overlooked or ignored, even if Jon's actions were noble. Instead of condemning him to death, John's cousin siblings arranged for him to join the Free Folk instead. Early in the Accursed King series, Queen Clementia of Hungary gave birth to a son named John. He would be the only king in France born into the title and the French king with the shortest reign since he would die in the cradle five days after birth. In the novels, he is murdered by a close relative with poison, or so it was believed. Rumors began to spread that the baby known as John the Posthumous didn't die after all. A man named Giannino Baglioni claimed to be the real John, now an adult and ready to claim his throne. Giannino claims that as an infant, he was switched with another child, one of low birth and raised in secret. It was the other child that died, not John himself. In the novels, the couple that raised John began their relationship in secret, a hidden affair. When the woman became pregnant, she was hidden away to hide her shame until she could give birth. She was then included into the plot to switch her infant son with the infant prince. So, this common couple end up raising a prince while their son is sent to live in a royal castle as a decoy. It was feared the prince would be assassinated, and those fears proved to be correct. Except in this case, the prince was safe, while the son of the common couple died in his place. When Jon Snow learned of his true identity, he wanted nothing to do with the Iron Throne. When Giannino learned of his true identity, he wanted to take what was rightfully his. Giannino Baglioni traveled throughout Europe attempting to find support for his claim. The Hungarian king believed him, but the Pope refused to grant him audience. Ultimately, Giannino was captured and imprisoned in Naples. He died in prison, a pretender. Elements of this tale are reminiscent of Jon Snow's story, as well as young Griff's. Giannino's attempt to reveal himself at the very end of the series is what interests me the most. Martin has said Jon will learn the truth about his parentage in The Winds of Winter, Book 6. The Lily and the Lion is the Accursed King's novel where the truth of Giannino is revealed. It is the sixth book of the series. And according to the show, Jon Snow will kill Daenerys. The revelation that Jon is in fact a Targaryen of royal blood is what leads him down this path. A path which leads to imprisonment and then banishment. In Giannino's story, we have a hidden affair in marriage, a secret pregnancy, baby swapping, and the hidden heir to the throne. Jon Snow shares so much in common with Giannino Baglioni. Perhaps their ends will be the same. Perhaps Jon Snow will also be a king without a kingdom. The Battle of Hardhome 600 years before the start of the story, Hardhome might have been the site of a bloody battle, one between humans, the children of the forest, and the others. Here's how. 
We are told on the night hard home burned, men walking the wall saw a fire in the distance burning so hot it appeared as if a second sun was rising in the north. Even if the size of this fire has been exaggerated, there's enough evidence to support the idea Hardhome was destroyed in part by a great fire. We know the others still exist in these lands beyond the wall. Could it be that the others attacked Hardhome and fire was used against them and their whites? Fire alone is not enough to stop the others. It will only dismay them. Dragon glass or dragon steel is necessary to destroy them. If the others did attack Hardhome, its citizens would have been utterly unprepared for such an assault. It could be they resorted to using fire to defend themselves as battle was lost. It would be the only effective weapon they had. It could be the fire quickly grew out of control and consumed the village. Alternative to this is that the others succeeded in attacking the town, and it was the children of the forest that in turn destroyed the village with fire to stop the dead from reanimating, essentially nuking the site. It would be the only way to be sure. The flaw in this is that none of the bodies at Hardhome were said to have the blue eyes the whites are known to have. One final theory I will posit before I let the mystery be is that Hardhome could have been destroyed by person or powers unknown. Let's put aside the Valerians, the children, and the others. Could it be some as yet unknown group of people fell upon Hardhome, massacred its people, only to vanish after the deed was done? Hardhome was said to hold a natural harbor deep enough to hold ships. The Sea Peoples were a hypothesized confederation from our own real world that was allegedly responsible for attacking ancient Egypt and other regions in the Mediterranean before vanishing. The identities of these Sea Peoples has never been confirmed. So unless Martin directly tells us or provides more clues within the text, we may never know the truth of what happened to the doomed wildling village 600 years ago. What happened at Hardhome just may have to remain a cold case. A cold case indeed. Thank you all for watching this video, a collection of short theories, volume one. Some astute viewers may have noticed the theories contained here have been featured on the channel before. I've noticed visitors to this channel prefer videos of a certain length, and so this compilation was created. This gave me a chance to make some minor corrections and provide additional information. I have to do what I can to attract an audience and also to please the almighty algorithm as well. So yes, this is old content, but if you haven't seen it before, it's new to you. And if you have, well, no you didn't. Either way, I hope you all have enjoyed this new old video, and if you did, please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Be sure to leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think about these short theories. Thank you to the following Patreon supporters and channel members, including Philip E., Daniel, and Jessica P. Again, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.